Welcome to a brand new episode of Seize the Moment podcast. Today we have a very special guest. We have Sabrina Little. She's an assistant professor at Christopher Newport University. Sabrina's research is in virtue ethics, classical philosophy, and moral psychology. She's also a five-time U.S. champion and world championship silver medalist in trail and ultramarathon running. And her new book, available now, is called The Examined Run, Why Good People Make Better Runners. Sabrina, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. And so in the book, Sabrina wrote, many philosophers do not share Plato's views, view of virtue. For example, Aristotle describes weakness of will, knowing what is what the good is and failing to do it, Acratia, and knowing what the good is and forcing yourself to do it, not because you want to, is Encratea. An example of acrasia is that I know I should stretch before running. I have read a lot of articles about this, but I still can't get myself to do it. Often I remind myself that I stretched one time about 10 years ago, and in so far as 10 years ago as prior to today, I suppose I did stretch before this run. You will notice here that my reasoning faculties are intact, and I'm still not practicing the good. My reason is misaligned with my desires and actions. An example of Encratea is that when often when I congratulate competitors after races who have beaten me, I do so begrudgingly rather than from a sincere delight in their performance. I act in terms of celebrating my competitors because I know I know it is what I ought to do, but it is certainly not easy for me. In this case, my reason is aligned with my actions, just not with my desires. I still lack virtue. So that's such an interesting insight because often we think of ethics and uh, doing the right thing is actually going against not sort of your will, but going against at least your desires. So it's like, uh, let's say uh, when I don't want to hurt somebody, uh, you know, when I want to like, you know, when your parents tell you like, yeah, you know, go share that with your brother or your sister. And you're like, I don't really want to, but they're like, but you're being a really good person and you're being a good sibling. Mm -hmm. So how come for you in this, at least, you know, in this understanding of it, uh, how come virtue is actually linked? It seems like with both desire and a sort of alignment of will and then actually action as well. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so for Aristotle, the understanding of virtue, it's a kind of happy integration of your faculties, right? It's desiring the good, no, like knowing what's good, desiring what's good, and then acting in terms of the good. And you're not actually a virtuous person if you don't desire the good, mm. um, which I, kind of matches my intuitions about these things. Like, Right. So if you have a grandmother who's very kind and loving and makes you a, your favorite meal every time you visit, you don't get the sense that they're doing it begrudgingly or because they ought to or because it's the right thing. Mm -hmm. Gen generally, when I meet someone who is who I would say excellent or, or virtuous, they have that kind of unity where they see what they should do, like they recognize it. They desire it and then and then they do it. And there's this kind of automaticity, this kind of fluency to it, not a force of will. So, yeah, for Aristotle, the, the idea is like um, if you're still forcing yourself to do it, then there's that little uh, infelicity in your character. Mm. Um, you should you should desire it. And, and so that's the objective. I got you. But initially, I mean, if, especially if someone let's say in your book, you talk about uh, coaching, right, uh, young athletes. Of course, you know, when they start out, right, and you, you definitely mentioned this in the book, I mean, you can't expect them to be perfect, right? You can't expect their thoughts, uh, actions, and, and behaviors to sort of, you know, be aligned, right? So, of course, the, the very fact that they're even trying to do something that they're not comfortable with doing, at least that is worthy of praise. And that's that's somewhere in their, like, in terms of developing virtue, at least that's a starting point. Uh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, absolutely. Yeah. So while you're developing virtue, it's that kind of like you're aligning your desires and wills. Sometimes you're aligning your um, like desires with someone else's directives, right? Like in the coaching instance, I tell them to do something. And at first it's, it's arduous, right? It's uncomfortable. They don't know why, but then through the coaching process, like they come to see why you do that thing, right? Like they develop this kind of understanding, but they also develop a kind of affinity for it. Um, and then it becomes something that they would choose for themselves. So I think mm -hmm. that coaching is actually a really good example of how virtue can develop, right? Like it starts off with this uneasy place, kind of taking your natural character and submitting it to what is good. Mm -hmm. And then eventually what is good is what you, what you choose. 
Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, because that's how child development tends to work. So uh, I'm a psychotherapist, and this is what we want for like the children that we treat. So when uh, you know we say things to children like, yeah, you know, you should try to share. You know, you're gonna make this other kid happy, and then we ask, okay, how do you think that he responded? Would you respond in the same way? So even though initially they do it begrudgingly, at some point they go, oh, wow, this is actually nice. Like I like making my little brother happy. Or obviously, if you're kind of uh, extending it out, then it's like I like making my classmate happy or whomever it is. And then you start to see that, oh, I share in the joy too. It's not just you know their joy it's actually my joy as well so yeah that's actually a really interesting way of looking at it because often when i think we think of morals uh we tend to think of it a little bit more masochistically where there's so much sacrifice involved like to be an ultimately good person you're sort of um this is really an extreme you're like imitating christ in some way right there's again there's super extreme but the point is to say you're significantly giving something up because you want to be a good person and it seems like at least in some religious understandings of it in order to be to be good you can't really have these things that you want there seems to be this kind of dichotomy between these are your pleasures, these are the things that you love and you want, and these are the things that you have to do. So I love that you have such a different perspective of it, that essentially there's somewhat of a unity in it. Yeah, I mean, um, my gosh, you're, you're taking me right into the deep end, but I, I'll say this. So for Aristotle, virtues are aligned to eudaimonism. Like there's a sense in which uh, virtues are constitutive goods of our nature that permit us to flourish. Right. So insofar as you do what you ought to do, you act in terms of what's good. Um, there's a kind of flourishing in that. Now, what does flourishing actually mean? Like that's going to depend, depending on what your commitments are, flourishing could mean any number of things. So you said, I mean, the example you gave was like imitation of Christ. It's like, what? it's like, take up your cross and follow me or martyrdom or, or things like that, that sound like really unsavory. Um, but but on those pictures, right, the what does eudaimonism consist of? What is the kind of flourishing life? Well, it's going to be different than it is for Aristotle. Aristotle is going to have this kind of excellences with respect to nature. On a Christian picture, picture like Thomas Aquinas has this kind of beatific vision or um, aligned with, with God. And, and so the way that virtues function are going to have a different direction on those pictures. Um, but there is this kind of like even on those pictures, there would be a kind of common grace way in which if you tend to be more just, if you tend to be more temperate, like you have well-ordered desires, um, you tend to be more prudent, you're probably going to live a better life on balance than someone who doesn't have those things. Because you can imagine an intemperate person, someone who has roving desires that make them fickle, right? Like mm -hmm. they can't mm -hmm. choose without being turned aside by things, that's not going to be a flourishing person. So if you can kind of habituate these, these virtues, um, you'll, you'll probably be doing better on balance uh, in your life than, than people who don't. Mm. Yeah. So I think what you're saying is that pure altruism of just like, you know, pure hedonism isn't exactly, these aren't great avenues to success. Well, obviously, you know, maybe financial and whatever that looks like, but obviously also mostly uh, personal success. So what's interesting about that is that when, you know, we talk about what means, uh, what means a good or what makes up a good life is that uh, it's so antithetical to what we think of in this culture. So for us, because, you know, we're a highly capitalist society, the thinking is it's, um, it's more kind of in line with people who are not just extroverted to go even deeper, who are pretty narcissistic and and so the thinking here is in order to thrive here, in order to be an individual success, which is what this country really like focuses on, fortunately and unfortunately, the person has to be uh, more so kind of um, more so in line with a less communal type thinking. But what you're saying fundamentally is I think what I was saying before, too, it's like, you know, when you share and you see that another person is happy, you get to enjoy that, too. It's not just their happiness. They're happy because of you. And there's a, some some sense of connection there or connectivity. And so what I love about this is that, you know, fundamentally, what we're saying is that you should look at the data. You should look at what happens happens when people are happy. When you ask, like, what's a meaningful life, you could kind of see it all around you. And again, when you think about the selfish pursuits, and this is what I really now want to get into, because obviously marathon running is an incredibly selfish pursuit. Uh, so <laughs> when you think about selfish pursuits, yeah. what happens is, is that those people are seemingly, at least for what we're seeing, you know, based on the data, based on kind of just what you're seeing, uh, you know, kind of more evidently, or more, more self-evidently, is that you're seeing that people who, let's say, value relationships, people who probably less so value accomplishments, they seem to have a more more meaningful life and maybe even much more happy one too yeah that's an interesting interesting point and i think well um right so oftentimes our intuitions about what's going to make us happy are wrong 
So I think that's one thing, right? Like we assume that having more money is always going to make us happier, right? Mm -hmm. And what do the studies show? They're actually, I'm, I, I would misquote the numbers if I got them, but there is a point at which subjective happiness tends to improve, but then it levels off. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you ask people of any, uh, any financial bracket, they're going to say more money would make them happier and they're actually wrong about that. So yep. our intuitions are often wrong. Um, but then I also think sometimes we are ordered toward goods and might not even recognize that those are the goods that we're ordered toward, right? Like, so participating in a capitalistic system, right? Like you might not even realize that you, you know, looking at all of your actions, they are in terms of just, <laughs> making more money. And really that might not be a good way of living a rich life. Or maybe it's um, all of your conscious attention is ordered toward beauty. Like you want to be more beautiful or you want success or you want more power. Like we have all these things that we assume are going to make us happy, but they're not ends in themselves, right? And they're not actually things that can satisfy a human. And so the idea of euda eudaimonia, eudaimonia, however you want to pronounce it, um, mm -hmm. is that it um, matches the kind of thing that we are as hum humans, um, our nature. And what is our nature? We're, well, we're social, we're rational, we have these appetites or desires, um, and when we can live kind of in an excellent way with respect to those faculties, then on balance, that'll be a better life than if we don't. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, so going back into uh, marathon running. So can you tell us about that? Because again, right, that is a super <laughs> selfish pursuit. So especially how did you, first of all, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I do want to ask how you merged that with philosophy, but yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you became interested in it and what were you, what did you think were some of your biggest accomplishments there? Uh, yeah, that's such a big question. I think that I was a runner before I was a philosopher. Uh, I don't remember a time when I ever didn't consider myself a runner. Um, so it's been kind of like a through line in my life. Um, in high school, I started to take it more seriously. I lived in the northwest corner of New Jersey, which is Appalachian. And so I just grew up kind of running on those trails and mm -hmm. growing kind of a facility with, with running fast on trails, um, which... I didn't know was training for a lot of what I would end up doing later in my life. Um, then I went to college to run cross country and track at the College of William and Mary. And after my freshman year, my mom was in remission from cancer. So I decided to run a fundraiser for the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition um, by running. So I ran 100 miles and it was through wow. my hometown. And I just thought it was something I was making up. But when it was put in the newspaper, I was contacted by a number of people who said it was one of the top times in the country for that year. And I mm. said, other people do this. Uh, so I, you know, I located the community. I started seeking out races. And before I knew it, it had snowballed into this thing that was growing quite large in my life and becoming a second vocation. Um, and since that time I've done, I mean, I will race anything. If you race me in a hundred meters, I'll do it. I just won't be good at it. Right. I just, I love racing. I love, I love competition. Uh, but I'm probably best known for the 24 hour run. Um, I previously held the American record in that and the, and also the 200 K. Um, and then I have, yeah, national records in what the 50 mile, um, for two years, I uh, or three years of 100 milers and then 24 hour um, US titles as well. So, yeah, I mean, when I state it out like that, I sound like a crazy person. <laughs> I, that's a, I mean, that's really impressive. That's no, a lot. Yeah, for real. Makes, makes me an untrustworthy narrator from <laughs> here on out. But yeah, so I have this outsized love of running, I suppose. Um, and it's it's something that's changing shape, I guess, like as I become a parent and mm -hmm. move deeper into my academic career and, and so forth. But yeah, it's it's kind of been something that's been there all along and I'm still doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And something that is really interesting is when did at least your knowledge or application of virtue sort of come into play in, in your experience as a runner? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So I, hmm, I, 
I taught at a Christian classical school, um, which was a school um, that was located actually down the street from where I was getting my my um, my doctorate at Baylor. And it was a school that took seriously character education through athletics. Hmm. And I had never really thought in a um, in an intentional way about the kinds of character that I was forming in <laughs> athletics. Hmm. You know, I mean, it's um, it, I think we kind of speak in a naive and general way about the formative role that athletics can play, but it's kind of, we speak of it as an unqualified good that mm-hmm. if you participate in sports, you're going to come out a better person. And yes. it's not like, that's not the picture we get from the highest levels of sport. Like we see a lot of vice in the NBA and the NFL and world athletics and so forth. So those are the people who've spent the most amount of time in sports. So maybe we should be asking questions about the ways in which we're being shaped. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, that working with um, teaching in that school and working with, I was the head cross country and track coach. I tried to develop virtue, right? Like use athletics toward that end. And um, it was really, I mean, I felt like I was lacking in resources. I did the best that I could. Um, And then I was at in graduate school and I was exposed to the classical tradition. I was exposed to Plato and Aristotle and acquiring this vocabulary of virtues and vice and the good life and flourishing and started to have some clarity on ways in which we could use athletics as, as a vehicle for, for um, virtue formation or just be more intentional, more intentional in, in thinking about how we occupy the sport how I was turning their affections and forming their loves, the kinds of things that I was saying to them, um, the kind of virtue and and vice vocabulary that was in, that I was employing, and and how to make it winsome to them. Because you have a group of kids who are ten to eighteen years old. Like, how do you get them to care about their character um, as something that's of greater value than even um, performance successes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could actually re- like there were many things that, while I was reading your book that I really related to. So I'm of, of course I'm no ultra marathon runner or marathon runner, but I do running. You know, when I go to the gym on a treadmill, it's not the same thing at all. It's not like running hills. No, it is. Know. It is. Ah, fair enough. Fair enough. I, but I think you get way more training from like having. You know, you don't have that flat ground that you're running on. I suppose at the gym, you get more bumps. It's training your feet more. And, but but the the main point uh, that uh, I guess I'm, I'm kind of driving towards is, um, yeah, like I did notice, like, for example, I remember reading uh, in the book, there was this part where you're talking about uh, when teaching the kids, there were some kids who like to uh, lead uh, or not lead, uh, they'd like to kind of uh, be at the front of the group while running, right? Uh, maybe from the start. However, that would um, use up too much energy and somewhere in the, in like half halfway during the run, they would lose energy. Or there were other kids conversely who maybe were, you know, fearful of maybe uh, running a little bit faster. So they kept just maintaining that slow pace in order to conserve energy the whole time. And one thing I really related to was kind of the first one, which is kind of like, no, you're trying to run as fast as possible. <laughs> it's almost like this like ego thing, right? Yeah. But um, something I did kind of learn to do later on is, no, of course, you have to pace yourself. You, if, if, if for 10 minutes you sprinted or for an hour you uh, maybe jogged or like at least did some sort of speed intervals or maybe you did go faster, slower, faster, that kind of thing, you get way more of a training out of that. If somebody was sprinting 10 minutes a day versus an hour a day or however much time at the end of that year, you're going to get way more training from pacing yourself and that kind of thing. Um, so I, I guess, where am I going with this? I, it more, it's more of like a comment on just like, I find that very relatable, how uh, learning to pace yourself can, you know, in, in terms of being patient as a virtue is yeah really important and i feel like it didn't just help me learning like learning to do that while running actually helped me outside of running as well oh can you say can you say can you say more well sure and it's in the book as well Mm -hmm. absolutely like yeah of course when working on an assignment for school doing something 
just generally that I would consider hard. Now that I kind of built up that discipline in terms of being able to sort of pace myself and, and many people on the surface, just as a side note, uh, they find running to be, uh, I've heard this at least boring, right? Like, oh, you have to concentrate. <laughs> how for... dare you? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I yeah. agree. I no. agree. How <laughs> dare you to those people? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And the, the thing is, uh, I mean, running when done correctly, it's actually really fun because you get, uh, like that runner's high flow state. You actually feel way better. Wait, than... Alan, can you go back? To I know I'm getting to it. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah, so people would find that, uh, that activity may be, uh, boring, right. But at least by, you know, when you develop, uh, the discipline in running and you actually kind of see the value in it, uh, well now you can run for, you know, whereas before it was 10 minutes, now 20 minutes, 30 minutes and so on. And, and kind of keep that concentration, whether it's on your breathing or just on, um, I don't know, meeting your goal, whatever is the time that you set for yourself. Well, now if you translate that to, to something else where, whereas before you would have given up after five minutes of engagement, 10 minutes of engagement, well, now, you know, ah, I'm actually able to concentrate in this one setting for this amount of time. Why can't I give that same level of concentration to this other activity? Mm. I've already proven to myself that I am able to do it in this other venue. So it's, it's great. Uh, well, yeah. It builds up your confidence. I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not just, I mean, it, and it's not just confident, uh, confidence, I think. So there's this ancient practice, um, called stabilitas Loki, um, mm. that was used by in the desert tradition of virtue and, and they would do manual labor and, you know, want to be turned aside by other things and they would stay on task. And it was a practice of remaining through difficulty. Right. Mm. And, it provides practice for more substantial commitments in your life, right? Like staying in hard conversations or remaining in place when you just want to leave, right? Mm -hmm. um, those are things that are uh, a big part of what it means to be free people, to be able to choose and not just follow our whims and our feelings wherever they go. Mm -hmm. And you have practice in doing that in, in running, right? So even when you're on the treadmill, like, I mean, actually perhaps more so on the treadmill, like people have a harder time staying in place on the treadmill, right? Um, because it's hard and sometimes boring. And also it's kind of like, yeah, it's a practice and having that kind of stability of place. Hmm. Very quick. Yeah. So what's interesting is like, yeah, I guess technically on the treadmill, you can argue. Uh, and I remember also from the book, there's this part where you talk, where you talk about, um, external impediments and internal impediments so like um yeah you could argue maybe on the treadmill there aren't really too many external impediments maybe none right in the sense that you 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 get the idea like you're on a treadmill it's not like you're running through a forest or a hill you might not have any obstacles come your way you're probably not going to have weather affecting you if you're on a treadmill indoors like things like that however one thing I also really related to is that internal impediment, right? I mean, if if you're not actually concentrating on the activity and engaging with the running or paying attention to your breathing and kind of really getting a sense for where your body is at during the workout, if you're thinking about what happened yesterday, this or something with the relationship or just something you have to do later and your mind's not focused, it could even, I mean, this might be just a subjective thing, but I, I really think this is relatable, but it can affect things like your breathing or your ability to do the same or harder sort of workout. Um, and, and I found that very interesting because then that also relates to stuff outside of uh, running, right? Because if you can get rid of internal impediments and actually be focused for 30 minutes or an hour, well then great, you can do that same thing. It's not just about like what we were talking about before, just being able to endure but it's also about uh, just in general, just your level of focus too, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I love everything that you just said. I talk to my students about this too. Um, they enter the classroom and think like, I'm just a person with a short attention span and as though it's something that can't change, right? So mm -hmm. I tell them have kind of an athletic approach to the way you uh, read texts, right? Like, so maybe you can read consistently for five minutes and then you need a break at the beginning of the semester, but you build that ability, right? It's, it's just the same as where you don't walk into a gym and pick up 
20 pound what is it dumbbells barbells i don't know mm-hmm. the difference no, no, between yeah. the two <laughs> yeah but uh you don't start with the big ones you start with the little ones and you work your way up right you learn how to you just like accustom your body to that right um yeah you get your your body ready for that um in in running you do that right you you can tolerate higher and higher loads and the same thing with other other aspects of life like reading and writing and so forth Mm -hmm. love that yeah and so just to go back uh whatever it was like you know 10 minutes ago so when we were talking about sports and sort of the virtues and vices of them so what's so interesting is that i mean listen this is just my perspective Uh, i get people would disagree with that but like what i what i find at least in the united states and listen i'm sure it's especially with soccer and stuff across the world it's the same thing or very similar is that when you see with sports is that they're like they're put on such a pedestal and they're so deified that it's almost what's not even almost they have explanations for everything so for every vice it's always turned into a virtue somehow so you get like so sabrina i don't know how much you like i follow like uh, football because i know you mentioned the nfl how much you follow like basketball whatever so like an example is like bobby knight so bobby knight who was a who was uh the indiana coach for like ages now um so for bobby knight i mean the idea was that like you know when he like cursed people out when he he even hit his players i mean it was all for this greater for this greater good you know the understanding was well bobby knight is trying to get the best out of his players and sometimes you have to push boundaries you know so obviously you know the people on the uh, child abuse of line of this they would say well I mean, he's abusing children and it's pretty obvious, but some of the fathers would say, well, listen, if he hit my kid, I mean, he's becoming a better basketball player. So what do I care? So what do you think about that? So how is it that like, let's say, so when we think about philosophy, we tend to think of uh, objectivity, right? So we tend to ask ourselves, like, what are virtues? Obviously I understand, you know, it's a kind of difficult question because it's very hard to think of something objectively, but we at least tend to find or look for these deeper truths. We don't want to just say, Hey, you know, this is a virtue to this person and it's not one to the other. Right. So how is it that like in sports, that seems not to be the case where in sports it's become so deified where we essentially take every vice and we turn it into a virtue just to keep this thing going yeah um yeah it's a good question um i in the book i call these performance enhancing vices Mm. right so there are certain kinds of qualities that someone might have that help them to perform well in whatever their athletic field or other domains of striving um and, and those can be things like pride or envy or um, impulsivity, right? Mm-hmm. And these are things that might help them perform, right? If you are an impulsive linebacker, I mean, it's got to help, right? But does it help you as a neighbor or a friend? Or does mm-hmm. it become kind of like a vulnerability for that person's family? Like, I think that one thing we don't ever talk about regarding certain sports and the certain ways in which we're formed is that this person is not just an athlete. This is someone's child. It's someone's neighbor. It's someone's friend. And we do know like there are statistics about higher rates of domestic abuse in certain sports, right? Sports that are more thumas or spirited type sports, um, at the, at the highest levels of the sport. Um, And so, I mean, it's certainly a question that we need to be asking, like, why are we celebrating something that is going to be that own, that person's undoing, but also threaten their family, right? Like Mm -hmm. asking those kinds of questions. Um, And I don't think any sport is off the hook. Like I, I don't think any social practice in general is off the hook. Like, I think that there are bad ways that I'm being formed in academia that are vulnerabilities in my family, right? Like, so, but I just think you have to ask that question, right? Like, um, how am I being formed? Are there ways in which I can have a good character and also compete well? Are there trade-offs? What should Mm -hmm. we think of those trade-offs? Right. I love that. So remember, I mean, you might not remember, uh, the Joe Paterno case. (laughs) Uh, So, no, <laughs> it's okay. So yeah, so Joe Paterno, just really quickly, I mean, so with the uh, Penn State Nitty Lions, I mean, he essentially knew that there was a child abuse. Um, I don't want to say it was a ring because it wasn't like, you know, so kind of significant, but there were a few people who were doing it. So essentially it, it, it was sexual assault. And so the thing is like the entire school ended up protecting Paterno. I mean, you had kids like literally picketing as though they were workers on strike saying like, we're going to leave this school unless you get Joe Pa. They call him Joe Pa. So unless you get Joe Pa like back in, like we need him, we love him, you know? So again, it wow. sort of makes you question, right? Of how important sports are in our culture and how did it get to be that way? Because on the one hand, it's sort of like, uh, I guess the one hand in some way 
always doesn't know what the other is doing. Where on the one hand, you get like, uh, you know, it's treated as, again, this incredible thing that like shapes our children and makes us, uh, you know, kind of shapes our national character even in some ways. But on the other hand, it's like, yes, but you're also kind of manipulating that perspective. If you really look behind the scenes, a lot of the stuff that's happening is like, uh, it's it's not, well, first of all, obviously everything is, you know, to whatever extent idealized. So it's not going to be that, but it's like, it's not actually benefiting most people. So if you have people defending, you know, pretty much child abusers, I mean, something's really flawed and wrong within the system. But yeah, man, but this culture is like super obsessed with winning. Uh, yeah, it's a, yeah. sort of a consequentialist view, right? Mm. In, in the sense that they, they care about the result. They don't care about yeah. how you get there. Yep. Yeah. 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 And I think the other, right, I, I do agree, right? It's in terms of the consequence, like whatever means necessary to win. But I also think there's this, uh, so there's this concept called norm differentiation, um, the idea that we have different standards for certain people, right? Be they leaders, right? Like, do we hold a president or a CEO to the same moral standard as like a regular employee or a constituent of the state? Do we mm -hmm. hold our athletes to the same moral standards that we are, right? Like if I do something good at work and I do like a victory dance, like, yeah, the way they do at football, like that would be weird, right? But we have a different standard for what is the norm, what is acceptable if you're um, if you are that in that role. Um, and, and I do worry about some of the ways in which we excuse them, right? Because being an athlete is a season of your life. It's not the whole of your life. And you're going to come out this side, other side formed by it Two, There's the fact that these athletes are exemplars and three, you have to worry about the costs on the community. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now, you know, now that we're getting into this subject, so even though, yes, sports are a season of one's life, I mean, for a lot of people, they are the whole of it. And one can even make the case as I mean, you do too, to whatever extent, is that like, you need to sacrifice almost everything to be great at this thing. So, you know, we talk about, let's say the Tom Brady's of the world, the Michael Jordan's or whatever. So, I mean, these people are assholes, you know, as much as, and listen, I'm because I'm a Bucks fan. I love Tom. So he was, he was wonderful for our team. He did things for us that no, we never thought would happen. Right. But he's an asshole. I mean, that's kind of the thing. So I guess then how do we make sense of eudaimonia and the fact that you are supposed to have some sense of balance, you know, whatever that would look like, obviously, maybe different for different people. But with the fact that in order to be successful, to be a Tom Brady, I mean, you're going to probably get divorced and you're probably not going to have many great relationships and you're probably going to treat your teammates like shit and so on and so forth. Oh, man. Yeah, I think. OK, so I'm going to shift the conversation just to running because I feel out of my depth in talking okay. about yeah, football yeah. with any yeah. kind of confidence. Yeah, yeah. But I think that at least in running and the highest levels of running, I think there is a way to be excellent, like to live a very narrow and deep life, but also um, be a good community member and um, to steward your body well and all sorts of things like that. And I say that with confidence because I know I like, I think that there are a few examples of people who do that really well within professional running. And I just like the reason I'm saying, I, I, I just don't know of who the heroes are in, in football and whether there's okay. someone who's yeah. really having like kind of an admirable, like living an admirable life. Right. And, and that's like the best evidence that it can be done. Like if you find someone who is, really um a meaningful member of their community um, who honors their family well who abides by the law like all of these kinds of things that we would want in a in a citizen and also is excellent in a given way mm -hmm. i think that's like a really good candidate for an exemplar and i just i don't know any in football so yeah but well, I, we're running but yeah. I, yeah but i do i do know some and i i do know of examples in, in the running space well, so how do they do it? How did they find a balance? Because I mean, I'll just kind of go back to sports, the other the other sports for a little bit. So like with Michael Jordan, I mean, the thing is, he was pissed off all the time. So like he was never happy because he was like, hey, we need to win more. Uh, he blamed his players for a lot of the losses, which I mean, listen, no, none of them were ever going to be as good as him. So like, I guess in the version of, you know, in marathon running, right? How would somebody who does have, uh, let's say the talent and the mindset of Michael Jordan, how can they mer merge that with a community oriented mindset? Yeah, right. I think, yeah, there is a certain personality in sport that like winning is insatiable. You just mm -hmm. have to keep doing it. Um, it reminds me of um, there's an image in Plato um, 
of like he describes oh Callicles is describing this tyrant who he says is like a leaky bucket and mm. you just fill the bucket all the time and the water just comes right out and you keep having to fill it forever and ever and ever mm. uh, and he also compares it to being someone who has an itch and keeps scratching forever and ever and they're never satisfied so yeah you can live a life like that and try to fill yourself up with victories and also it's not going to work. <laughs> and so you will be itching yourself your whole life. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and we all know personalities like that. I think, so if you were to occupy the sport in an excellent way, that's not at odds with community. I think there's a kind of, um, yeah, like returning, like turning the attention, like using your platform or turning the attention back to the community, investing in the community, serving the community. Right. And so in, in distance running, we have this, um, we have this thing called crewing, right? Like you go on these mountain adventures, you run for a hundred miles or something like that, but you don't, you're not completely alone because you'll have friends or family meet you at various places along the course and they'll mm. be holding food for you, holding water, things like that, um, just to make it so that you can get through to the end of the journey. Mm. And they're invaluable. And we'll have some of like the top stars in the sport, right? Like the, the peak performers out there playing that role for other athletes. And so there's that kind of like return, that kind of service orientation, um, like being part of a the community and showing up at events and just having proper humility to you and not just wanting to make every conversation about yourself. I think oftentimes the mistake that athletes make, and it's easy to see why, because press, you know, telling their story and putting them on a pedestal, like they're some sort of Greek God, but having humility, pride sees itself as it, if you're proud, you see yourself as more valuable and that's a mistake of valuing, right? Like you are not more valuable than other people. You are just celebrated <laughs> though you are in that context. And so I think if you have like a kind of proper recognition of your own limits and your reliance on other people and you care for others, like that is a way of, of being excellent in the sport. Oh, I love that. So I have a follow-up question. So, okay. And so you have against somebody like Michael Jordan and imagine if he accepts, um, and I forgive me, Scotty Pippen. So, but imagine if he accepts, you know what? I'm just as good as Scotty Pippen, right? So, which, you know, obviously Scotty Pippen is not as good as Michael Jordan. So let's say he says, you know, I'm as good as him. Right. And then, so what happens to that hunger then? So, I mean, the pride sort of feeds hunger, right? Hunger feeds confidence and then so on and so forth. So do we say something along the lines of like, okay, well, since Michael Jordan is kind of like maybe a little bit, uh, let's say closer to the Scotty Pippen's level, should we just say that's good and we should keep it that way? Or should we say, well, listen, man, we'd rather have a proud, a prideful Michael Jordan than, uh, let's say, I don't know, more tamed one. Yeah, right. Like if you're the the person in charge of the franchise, you would think like this anger is entertaining and it's keeping us successful. And so you have perverse incentives there. Like you want yeah. these people undoing themselves in competition. Yeah, I think socially competition is interesting, right? Because uh, oftentimes when people ask if you're competitive, they mean like, are you undone by loss? Mm. Do you have to win? Are you at odds with your competitors? And strictly speaking, that's not competition, that's envy, right? Yeah. And so yeah. uh, there's a way of being excellent and trying to outdo one another and calling one another to a higher standard that does not involve this kind of unhappy self-assertion that is characteristic of envy. Like you could have, I mean, it's an interesting counterfactual. Like what if Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan got along really well? Like what could they have done together? Like, it's hard to say, like, would that have been, uh, like, would it have been, is it more productive actually to, to be envious and to, um, need to defeat the other person or or could you you know have this kind of love of team that animates this kind of mutual task of rising together what would that result in and i can't answer that question i think it's an empirical question right like and we would need another michael jordan and scotty pippen to, <laughs> to play that out for us so we can know uh, but I do know from the literature on um, kind of constructive forms of comparison, like emulation versus malicious envy. Malicious envy wants to undo the other person, whereas um, 
what's called benign envy or emulation, this kind of like um, outdoing one another, kind of striving. Um, the, the person who emulates wants to improve with respect to where they are rather than undo the other person. And so it seems like emulation would, within the terms of the sport, excel, whereas yeah. envy might cause like, might cause your own undoing, might cause you to do things that don't actually support the game, right? Thwart the conditions of success. And and so I, I wonder if you could compete both with higher integrity to the, the rules of the game, honor the game, honor your community better if you weren't envious, but I can't tell you for sure <laughs> mm -hmm. that things would turn out better. Potent potentially the, the way to solve for that issue by still having, you know, uh, by maintaining integrity. Um, I, I mean, I've, I've seen it in, uh, let's say the UFC, right? I don't watch a lot of UFC, but essentially um, they'll kind of make up feuds. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's been, they're not real feuds, but they are playing on the audience's emotions by playing on like the effects of what like things like envy or maliciousness might do for an audience, but not actually have authentic, if you could call like it wrestling. Authentic. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just about to say that. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like wrestling in that sense. You're sort of making up this sort of narrative in order to, you know, for the audience uh, side of things. So this way they get that entertainment out of it, but you could still behind closed doors, have that uh, res mutual respect. Right, right, right. Um, also, just on Michael Jordan, listen, I mean, honestly, to what, did, I mean, he was, he was incredible, right? The greatest. The greatest, right? Fair enough. Mm -hmm. To what degree do you think he examined himself? Mm -hmm. Maybe he did in the sense of what can I do to be better mm -hmm. to get this result? How can I? He did. Of course. Mm -hmm. In that sense, Yes. But do you think there was a sort of a holistic self-examination? No, no. Right. So <laughs> when we when we talk about like when we're at like when you're asking, like what would he have had to have done? Right. I agree with you asking that, where that's coming from. But at the same point, it feels like almost the book is sort of aiming at, you know, this 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 is what could happen if you did examine. Right, right, right. Okay, but wait. Okay, so but hold on then. So Sabrina, I'm going to ask you one last tough question in relation to the Michael Jordan topic. So Michael Jordan, no matter what happens, he's always going to be. I'm going to just use Scottie Pippen just again, unfortunately for him. So Michael Jordan will always be more naturally gifted than Scottie Pippen. And so what happens if Scottie? But let's say Jordan does all these things, right? He decides, you know what? I want to be a better teammate. Uh, I want to kind of help everybody flourish. I want to help them become the best people that they could be, and I want us to become a winning team, right? What happens when somebody like a Scottie Pippen can't deal with his own envy? Oh, wait, if he can't deal with his own envy. Yeah. So oh, like you mean, so it's only one-sided or something like that? Yeah. So let's say Jordan is like an exemplary person, right? So he he reaches, you know, this flourishing state and he's like, you know what? I understand, you know, it's not fair. I have these natural talents that other players don't, yada, yada, and I want to help them. But let's say Scottie Pippen then V7. Let's say Scottie Pippen's like, no, fuck you. I don't like that you're better than me. Yeah. Um, I think that we've all been in that kind of position, right? Like you extend a hand and then someone's not interested in that yeah. kind of relationship. Um, so what would you do in that case? I mean, I hope, hopefully take the high road, right? Like you don't, um, have to return fire for fire. I, mm -hmm. I still think you can, like, there are people who I'm not friends with and also I see what's excellent in them. And then it, calls me to a higher standard, right? Because they give me like a vision of what I might want to do or be instead, right? So mm -hmm. maybe, maybe one basketball player could look at the other basketball player and say, you know, like, <laughs> we do not get along. And also, like, I admire his perseverance, I would like to likewise be perseverant or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and can I say something about the original question of these guys don't want this, right? True. Like they, that's what you had said. Um, I think that, so how do you get someone to care about wanting to have a good character? I think a lot of it is having that person who exemplifies what it looks like to be excellent in the sport. Like, I think if you have that vision, then you will want to do the same thing, right? So we just need that one player who has a good character. Mm -hmm. We need that one player who sets the standard, who's like this kind of moral buoy for 
providing a different vision of of how we can be excellent and also um like not at odds with our community and so forth like if we just have that one mm -hmm. <laughs> that everyone would have like you know be able to see be able to appreciably perceive what that could look like and and that often does the work of of initiating a practice and caring about your character kind of in the same way like when we're children right so you have that scout leader or coach right. or something who's excellent and you admire them and you imitate them in certain ways like if all, all we need is that one guy mm. <laughs> and then like the, the sport can improve mm. yeah because in like major sports here we don't really have much of that so but in the running community you're saying they exist yeah, well, yes, but I think that there are certain ways in which running and a good life, like a lot of the sorts of traits that select for good performance are also traits that undergird a good life, mm. like um, having a kind of proper humility, like, because if you're proud, that would mean you misconstrue your own limits and you would crash and burn right so you have to know you have to have like a fair recognition of where your talents actually are i think there's like perseverance the ability to stay in place um, the ability to down regulate your emotions when you're distressed like impulsivity is not a virtue in long long distance running like being able to have emotional control is being able to be patient and so forth and so i think it's easier to find people who satisfy the these virtues that support performance in in distance running perhaps than in other sports and i think another issue that we don't have in running is that there's not this fame industrial complex around mm. it like mm. i can go for runs and no one will know right like sometimes i've finished big races and it's like five people in the middle of the woods clapping Right. Like I'm not in a stadium. I don't have um, cameras all around me and things like that. And I think if you do, there's a sort of setting you up as if you're Achilles. There's a kind of praise and attention that forms your character in certain ways can make you kind of can develop your appetite for um, praise, can mm -hmm. can make you more vainglorious. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's what we often I think that's a lot of a lot of what we see in these more uh these bigger sports like these big fan type sports um so sometimes i think like if you just have the lower level basketball or lower level football like you'll see a lot of the good making formative um formative aspects of the sport but then once you introduce the kind of attention mm -hmm. you start to see things unraveling a little bit more yeah, which is like, I mean, again, in American sports, that's all we get. And one could even argue that the attention, for the most part, is what most of those people are seeking. So it's like, I guess I kind of wonder uh, if you could sort of separate the two, you know? So, and then again, again I wonder, you know, it's like uh, in your sport, we see that there's such a, I would, I guess it is significant, you know, I was going to kind of minimize it. Uh, there is a significant <laughs> discrepancy between characters because like, even though we, these are like team sports, I mean, in, you know, football, basketball, whatever. I mean, they're also very individualistic because yeah, ultimately people are searching for for fame and they're searching for glory for themselves i mean in their families or whatever you know they're searching for money also let's also keep in mind that i mean sometimes people vacillate between virtue and uh, i guess unvirtue right right so i'm sure there's somebody in major sports i understood that you, like, you couldn't come up with an example but i'm i'm sure that like they could probably kind of oscillate between you know acts of virtue and then not being very you know what it is but they're also not very good that's what i'm saying so uh, let me just be clear so not well not to say they're not very good but they're decent players but like the best of the best are not great people i don't like, know yeah <laughs> i'm telling you i can't if somebody can point out one football player who's like legitimately the best at what he does and he's a great person i'll, I'll stay uncorrected the best at what the he best does. At the best, and then the best. also, yeah, and also a great player. Yeah, I'm sorry, great, great person. Yeah, I see. It's, I, that's what I'm saying. It's kind something of something like to research. Yeah, right, right. right. It's know? a tough combination. So, but, do you but, think this? Yeah. Do you think that observation translates to other domains too, like top CEOs? Yeah, yeah. 
Like, so I don't disagree. I'm sure that there are outliers somewhere. I just wonder how they do it. Because again, this isn't, or it doesn't seem to be the norm, especially when, um, let's say, oh, so uh, listen, I'll give you guys examples. So uh, John Gruden, who's uh, pretty much a disgraced coach. He's had his own issues at this point. Not really going to get into it. But uh, the point is to say that like when he talks to his players, it's like really vicious. So he'll say like, I, I, listen, a lot of this stuff is for camera. I get it. But like, he will tell you, he'll say, listen, guys, I understand you're on the same team, but you have to cut each other's hearts out. Listen, this is verbatim. Him. I'm quoting him. He says, you have to cut each other's hearts out because at the end of the day, the guy behind you is trying to do that to you. He's taking away your food. He's taking away food from your family and he's literally trying to kill you. He'll say stuff like that. So when you're growing up in that environment and you're taught that, hey, you can be cut at any minute and any at any point that all of this could end. I just wonder how in that kind of environment, people can actually flourish or become really kind of community oriented. So going back into like Tom Brady, who is obviously a great example here. So Bill Belichick, the former coach of the New England Patriots, he was notorious for this he would always say things like that and so with Brady like I mean he was terrible to like the backup quarterbacks unless so if he felt they were threatening that just to be clear I mean he wasn't terrible to all of them and so anytime he had somebody behind them he would not necessarily sabotage him but he certainly wouldn't try to make them better players and he wouldn't go out of his way he probably wouldn't even give them advice to be honest with you so I would wonder how in that kind of environment you can get the combination of the two okay but was he good to anyone else but they weren't threats to him yeah sure okay now, I agree because they weren't threats to him, him being good yeah. because they're not a threat. Oh, I agree. That's not pure. Let me let me be, let me just be clear. But, Sorry, let me be let me be nuanced. Yeah. Let me just be nuanced. So Tom Brady is great to you when you do what he needs you to do. So if you drop the ball, he's going to curse you out. OK. Yeah. Well, listen, I, how am I how am I to put this? I feel like, for example, no one is completely virtuous. I'm sure, especially in the in the domain of running as well. People can have like either an off day, an off moment. Uh, maybe a lack of integrity in one particular aspect sure, or sure. something like that. Well, we're talking about aggregates. So, I mean, for the most part, Tom Brady is not that great of a person. No offense to him. Fine, fair enough. <laughs> okay, I won't Yeah, argue. so that, I mean, that's what I, you just said, what I was going to say, which is that virtue is exceedingly rare anyway, right? Oh, so do mm -hmm. you get someone who's excellent in nearly every respect, above reproach in nearly every respect? Well, it's going to be hard, hard to find in general. So do we find them in the top athletes in the sport? Probably not. I mean, there are cultural um, reasons why, right? Like we might not find that, but I think in general, find, finding that's going to be hard. I mean, a lot of us, it's not as though like we are strictly terrible either, right? Like there's space between vice and virtue. A lot of us have what is called mixed character. So we're somewhere yeah. along the line. So in some ways we act excellently for some of the right reasons and consistently do so. Like, take honesty. I'm, I'm going to, if, if I tend to be honest to my friends, I'm probably going to continue to be honest to my friends. If I tend to lie in other circumstances, I might tend to lie. Like there's that kind of consistency such that we do mm -hmm. have moral traits, mm -hmm. but they don't neatly track virtue <laughs> or vice in the way mm -hmm. that we might expect they do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because one could also even argue just in terms of moral education that like, yeah, when you're spending a lot of your time training and becoming better at this specific thing, you're so narrowly focused that you're just not taking on the moral education. Because I mean, honestly, most of us just learn what our parents tell us, you know, this is good, this is bad. Coach is another example, right? Coach said this is okay. Coach said this is not okay. And then you just move on and you train. So for the most part, I mean, many people are not taking philosophy courses and certainly not reading many philosophy books. Yeah, but the thing is like, okay, so maybe I'm formed by bad parenting, maybe I'm formed by a twisted coach or something like that. I'm still accountable to my character. Like I can't say, you know, like say I do something bad and I'm sentenced, uh, like I'm in a courtroom and I say, hey, I had a bad coach who told me it was okay if I push people or something like that. They would say, yeah, how old are you? You're accountable to your character. Or right. I mean, if, if you think of some of like the worst people in human history, like Hitler, Pol Pot, or, or Mao, like they all have tragic upbringings with mm -hmm. terrible parents. And also it was on them that they did terrible things, right? So yeah, maybe people don't care about it. Maybe they're not asking themselves the hard questions that they should about how they occupy the sport or how they live their days. At the end of the day, they are accountable to it. And whether or not they ask the question of, am I living a good life? They are living a life. Right. And so if you don't ask the question, you might end up where you don't want to be. Mm. Yeah.
And now getting toward the end of your book, you start talking about, and you know, as you read about a good life. Uh, so what does that mean, right? So because ultimately what people would ask is, uh, or would rather what people would say is, well, it seems pretty subjective, right? Uh, Tom Brady could say, well, I'm living a good life. Yeah, I might be an asshole, but you know, this is what's the, so actually, wait, I'm actually going to use an example. I'm actually another Tom Brady example. So because there's a, recently a documentary that came out called Dynasty about the Patriots. So somebody actually asked, by the way, Tom Brady, what is the meaning of life? And he said, oh, I figured it out. I, I can tell you. So Tom Brady said, <laughs> After, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he said after he won uh, the Super Bowl with the Falcons, I don't remember the number of it. So whatever year it was, like 2016 or something. Sure. So he said, oh, I figured it out. I figured out like what the purpose of my life was. So he said, at that point, I realized that the purpose of my existence was to reach my full potential. I made a goal for myself that I was going to play until my mid 40s and I was going to be the best of all time. That's it. That's what the meaning of my life is, right? And people are like, yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. You're, you're Tom Brady. So I'm assuming your version is a little bit different. And can you tell us why it would be? <laughs> Yeah, what happens when you're 40 years old and one day? Well, he, <laughs> right? and he already did, by the way. He's already <laughs> retired. So, I mean, that one day already came. Yeah, right. Like, I think that if we order our lives by satisfying our desires or what we think we desire or hitting our goals, things like that, there's always life on the other side of them. And it's a kind of way of just not, it's like a very presentist and narrow way of understanding your life. I mean, of course, hitting goals is part of a rich life, but is it exclusively in and of itself a rich life? No. Right. And I think we see this with um, what's called post-Olympic blues or post-Olympic depression. You have these athletes who spent their whole lives getting ready for this one day, this one giant competition that is going to give them identity and purpose and so forth. And then they fall into this deep depression. It happens every Olympic cycle, right? And why is that happening? Because these kinds of desires, while all consuming at the moment are not something that actually, they don't change who we are, right? Mm -hmm. They're not some, they're not a good that suits like the human person in its entirety. Mm -hmm. So what is a good life? I mean, I draw on Plato and Aristotle, Aristotle specifically uses the word eudaimonia, um, this kind of flourishing life. Um, he describes it as an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. It's this kind of um, lived activity of becoming excellent in, in any number of respects. I mean, it, it involves rational goods, it involves social goods, and mm -hmm. it involves having this kind of command of your emotions in a certain way. And honestly, like he doesn't fill in, he doesn't give you details, right? Because there are many kinds of life. It's not as though like one life is um, just, you know, the only kind of life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what does it look like? I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are some people who are in love with the piano and want children. And I'm sure there are other people who you know, are academics and like to boat, right? Like you could fill in the blanks, but it's going to have to involve this kind of, it's going to have this intellectual character. It's going to have this kind of um, like acting in injustice in the community. It's going to be a long life, he says, which, you know, you could debate him about that. Um, and it's going to involve being excellent, right? Like kind of not letting your capacities lie fallow. Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay, then. So as we start wrapping up, Alan, any final questions for Sabrina before we go? Yes. Uh, if we wanted to follow you, follow your work, and, and of course, buy the book, uh, where can we do that? Yeah, so I'm Sabrina B. Little on Twitter or X, Instagram, yeah. Facebook, Threads, Strava. That's the running platform where you log your your, your running. Hmm. Uh, and the book can be bought on Amazon or at Oxford University Press website. And it's called The Examined Run. I love it, Sabrina. Thank you so much, man. I this love, is awesome. Yeah, I love these type of conversations because like, you know, we, especially again in this country, we have like this sort of narrative about what it means to be happy. And it's usually super focused on achievement. So I love it when somebody can say, hey, if you look at these other aspects of life and if you look at some of the data, you actually might be wrong. So thank you again so much for coming on. This was phenomenal. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. Take care. Take care. All right. So everyone, uh, if you like this episode, you can follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook and on Instagram, on Twitter, where it's Seize underscore podcast. Like, subscribe, hit, hit the, the bell, bell on YouTube. YouTube. 
And again, thank you so much for watching and see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.